Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. On behalf of the Powder Coating Institute, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Your Guide to a Healthy Powder Coating System, presented by John Cole with Parker Ionics. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that all attendees are on mute, so if you have any questions along the way, please type them in the questions panel. The speaker will address the questions at the end of the webinar. If we run out of time, contact information will be on the closing slide for you to submit any additional questions. This webinar will be recorded and available through the PCI store within two business days. All attendees will receive a brief survey right after the webinar. Please take a few moments to reply. We appreciate your feedback as PCI continues to develop new programs to offer the topics and training you need. Now I'd like to introduce the presenter for today's webinar. John Cole is president of Parker Engineering of America and its operating unit, Parker Ionics. He has 50 years of finishing industry experience and is a licensed professional engineer. John is a frequent speaker for both PCI and the Chemical Code Association International. He is also an industry expert writer for multiple trade magazines, blogs, podcasts, and webinars. He has a bachelor's degree in industrial and systems engineering from the University of Michigan. John, take it away. Well, thank you, Kevin. I thought I'd I hope you can see this is my ugly mug that's up there now and I'm going to get rid of it in a, in a quick second, but I want to welcome everybody to the webinar today and thank Kevin for the kind introduction and and I want to want to go over something that Kevin mentioned um, specifically about questions. Uh, if we were sitting in a classroom right now, the question and answer would be an interactive thing. Hands would be raised and, and it would be easy to see them. On a webinar, it's not so easy to see them, but questions are critical to everybody getting a good understanding of what the material is. Uh, I tell people when I when I hold a classroom uh, environment that uh, I was the guy that was always afraid to ask a question because I didn't want to look stupid. Um, but I guarantee you, if you're that person, there's 20 or 30 or 40 other people in the classroom that have the same question. And the, the smart one is the one who raises their hand. So uh, throw out questions during the seminar, our webinar. Uh, Kevin will accumulate them and then at the end, we'll go through them. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're gonna talk you, our way through uh, what I believe it takes to, to keep and maintain a healthy powder coating system. For a lot of you, some of this material will be uh, repetitious, but the more times you hear it, the better it sinks in. So. Kevin, how much did it's somebody somebody muted me for some reason? How much did everybody miss? Uh, everything since or no, um, we had you um, up until you just started the presentation. So okay, asking, all right. We heard everything about asking questions. So okay, can, thank you. Continue from the top. <laughs> so I so the first question I ask is who loves powder coating, and I say the answer is just about everybody. As you can see from the slide, even Abe Lincoln loves the powder coat. So. Uh, uh, why do we love powder coating? Well, first of all, it's easy. Anybody can pick up a powder gun, trigger it, throw some powder at metal, and it sticks. Very easy on the surface. It looks great. It's a much better finish than, than wet painting. Uh, it has a very nice look. It's very durable. Um, and then it's functional. So, you know, why wouldn't we love powder coating? Now the other side, who hates powder coating? People who do it wrong. You know, there's a there's a, a right way to powder coat and a wrong way to powder coat. And if you're doing it the wrong way, it's not fun and uh, uh, very problematic. People who cut corners, there are rules, there are things that you have to do to make powder coating work properly. Cutting corners, it's gonna make your job uh, uh, miserable. 
and people who have no training I, i'm going to really harp on training here um because i think it's it's one of the most important things that that you can do for your profession you're training right now so you're all all in a really good place so how do we do powder coating correctly first and foremost again get trained what we find in the industry is we'll train somebody they'll come to a pci class or a cci class we'll train them they'll go back to work and then another job becomes available and off they go so who trains the next guy well hopefully pci cci or one of the other professional organizations how else do we do powder coating correctly we follow instructions again if there's a right way and a wrong way to do it you're taught the right way follow the instructions we also need to make investments in the process in order to keep it uh, uh, going correctly we need to invest in our pre-treatment uh, uh, program Pre-treatment chemistries and, and approaches change often, so we need to stay current with it. Same thing with our powder. We need to invest in, in good powder technology from good, reliable suppliers, and we need to invest in equipment. Uh, if you've got equipment that's 40 years old, you, you need to invest in an upgrade. So who needs to get trained? Well, I say obviously the coders need to be trained. But I think more importantly, the supervisors and business owners need to be trained. We train lots of coders through the PCI and uh, they all go back to work with lots of great ideas and lots of energy to, to do it right. And then we get a business owner or a supervisor that says, well, we can't do it that way. We can't spend the money, we can't do this. So what happens to the guy who just got trained by a bunch of professionals? His bubbles burst and he goes back to his old old uh, way of doing things where do we get training training i got to recommend the powder coating institute through their 101s and their 202s you get both fundamental basic training and advanced training and this training is done by industry professionals that know what they're talking about where else can you get training uh, powder manufacturers most major powder manufacturers either through their tech service group or through their corporate headquarters offer uh, training programs. Equipment manufacturers, I know all of the major gun manufacturers all do training for their customers on a regular basis. And chemical suppliers, chemical suppliers, again, either through corporate or through their tech service people can provide the necessary training within their envelope, within the pretreatment side. So training is extremely important. So now you've been trained, now what's next? Well, we recommend you convert your training to new work instructions, equipment updates, and new powder and pretreatment choices. In other words, uh, uh, go back, um, get, your, get your processes in order. And I, I'll speak a little later to process, but, but I'll say it now, powder coating is a process. It's not a singular element. It's a process of many uh, individual elements that have to work perfectly in order to be successful. Um, so work instructions are real important. Uh, learn about e equipment updates. You probably, when you're out training, you're hearing about all the latest technology. So convert that training to new equipment updates and new powder and pretreatment choices. Uh, powder powder technology is changing, ever changing, as well as pretreatment. Uh, pretreatment has had a lot. The, the the chemistries have had a lot of significant improvements uh, over the past few years. Develop in-house training instructions to ensure continuity and uniform coding practices. Go back, document how things are to be done right. Keep those documents available for other, other painters, other coders. Um, and schedule regular updates with your powder, chemical, and equipment suppliers. Your, your powder salesman or tech service guy will come in on a reg regular basis if, if asked and provide you with uh, regular updates. Same with the chemical and equipment suppliers. Invest. If your equipment is seven or more years old, it's really time to look into investing in new application equipment. Um, 
uh, there's uh, ever-changing technologies in pH monitoring, uh, conductivity monitoring for the pretreatment side, uh, nozzle technology, lighting, uh, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, um, equipment that needs to be updated on a regular basis. Um, and, and at a bare minimum, uh, processes need regular tune-ups. Um, again, it's a it's a process. Everything needs to be looked at. So when I say regular tune-ups, we're talking about uh, uh, you know checking your you know doing your routine maintenance, checking throat pipes, checking all the powder path for uh, uh, impact fusion, etc. What about your powder? How's your powder stored? Your, your powder manufacturer will tell you to store it in a temperature and humidity controlled environment. Is it over a year old? Most powder manufacturers suggest that after a year, uh, powder uh, is not usable. Now I know in reality, every one of you that's got a powder shop has powder boxes that are three or four or five years old that one day you intend to use and you may or may not, but uh, uh, talk to your manufacturer about what happens to your powder after uh, after its uh, shelf life is depleted. Are you using dry compressed air? We recommend 38 degrees Fahrenheit pressure dew point compressed air, clean of oil and clean of uh, particulate. Do you know your, your uh, dryer is working on a regular basis? Do you even check? What we find is most times the compressor and the dryer are way back in the dark corner of the plant, and God knows nobody ever goes back there to check on it. But one day of coating with moist or oil-laden air can destroy your entire powder operation. If you reclaim your oversprayed powder, you need to be aware that over time, especially if you're using a cartridge filter booth, over time fines in your powder could lead to trouble. Fines are defined as uh, particles lower that are powder particles that are smaller than, I guess it's variable, but right around 10 to 12 microns. Uh, those powder particles don't like to take a charge and they never go away from your system in a uh, cartridge environment, a cartridge filter environment. So you need to stay on top of the ever increasing amount of fines in your feed hopper. Uh, what do we recommend? If you are reclaiming oversprayed powder, we recommend that you do a grab sample every six to eight weeks of your feed hopper, send that off to your powder manufacturer and ask them to do a particle size analysis. Because if the, the percentage of fines in your feed hopper builds up, um, you're gonna find that your coating quality and your coating efficiency is dropping off significantly. Fines do not take a charge, but they do take up space in the system and all they do is get recycled and recycled and recycled. Are you using, uh, are you spraying textures or metallics? Uh, if you're doing either one of those, we recommend a fluidized hopper, fluidized feed hopper uh, is much better than a, a, a box feed for these types of materials. On the pretreatment side, who set up your pretreatment process and when was it done? Was it done 15 years ago? Well, a lot has changed between then and now, and you need to stay on top of it. Maybe it's time for a, a review of your overall pretreatment uh, process. Um, some of you may not even know where the original setup came from. I also ask, are, are work instructions available? Um, you know, is there a booklet of how to titrate? Is there a booklet of how to how and when to dump and clean your tanks? Um, work instructions should be available. I think you saw that a few slides back. I'm really big on on work instructions because they are your Bible on how to do things. And how is your chemistry maintained? Do you do daily titrations of your tanks? And if you do, do you keep a log of of uh, your your uh, titrations? A logbook is is critical when it comes to uh, titrating for pretreatment. And then add on to that, uh, how often is your uh, employee who's doing the titration getting checked on uh, on his proper technique? 
I would say that a, uh, a good pretreatment company would be in on a regular basis doing a, a secondary titration to validate your employee's titration. So these are just some things to think about. On the curing side, uh, how often do you do the following? Do you run an oven profile on a regular basis? Um, it, it, hopefully everybody knows what an oven profile is, but but it's fundamentally you take a, a, a computer and, um, and some thermocouples and you place the thermocouples on a typical load rack and run it into your oven, leave it in there for uh, an hour or more and pull it out and it, it, what you, you'll get is a log of the temperature data in your oven. You can find cold spots this way. Uh, you can find if your oven is out of whack and, and not reaching set point. Um, very important. Um, and I like to tell people that, um, you know, they say, how often should I do an oven pack or profile my oven? And I say, well, do it as often as you can and and remember that in between every oven profile if something goes awry a fan belt breaks uh the gas the linkage gets uh cattywampus you don't know about that until it's out your parts are out in the field and, and could be under cured and, and causing you all sorts of trouble you should run an oven profile on a regular basis uh, i think powder guys will do that for you um certainly on bigger bigger shops you should have your own uh data pack or oven pack to run uh profiles do you check your fan belts for wear and misalignment on a regular basis we just had a situation at a customer's plant wasn't our oven um where um all of a sudden he started uh um over temping his oven and we we couldn't figure out what was going on and and uh we climbed up on top of the oven because this is where the exhaust fans are typically uh, located. We climbed up on the top and found that the fan belt had fallen off of the exhaust fan. So we were just building up hot exhaust gases inside the oven and uh, uh, went into overtemp. You should check your fan belts on a regular basis. The other thing you should check on a regular basis is your filters. And what we find a lot on top mounted burner boxes on batch ovens or, or uh, conveyor ovens is if they're up on the top they're not being looked at and uh, the time you find out you got a problem is when you have a problem and a simple annual or not annual but regular uh climb up on top of the oven and look at your burner look at your filters look at uh, your fan belts that will put you in a, uh, a preventive maintenance mode rather than a reactive maintenance mode uh, and also always test your e-stop circuit. So now we're on to the powder application equipment and booths. And let's start with the single most important aspect of powder coating. And if you've had me in front of you teaching before, you'll know that the single most important aspect or the single most important way to assure high quality, low cost productivity is to have a good ground. Oh, that, Nope, we want a great ground. Good, good is good. Uh, great is much better. Is your product good or is your product great? We want to go for great. It is the single most important aspect of powder coating. And and I I like to call myself a ground fanatic because if I'm in your plant, that's the first thing I look for is where's your ground. Um, and we look at it from from three different aspects: safety quality and cost. So from a safety point of view, uh, we want anything inside the booth, whether it's your part hanging on a hook, uh, whether it's uh, the, the anything that's conductive inside the booth has to be less than one meg ohm to ground. And we check meg ohms or check conductivity uh, or resistivity using a megger. Um, and I, I think I go into that in a little while. From a quality point of view, a good ground assures you of minimized orange peel and improved Faraday cage penetration, two of the biggest issues you face as a coder on a daily basis. And then from a cost point of view, uh, a good quality ground maximizes transfer efficiency. In other words, you're gonna put more powder on your part 
with a good ground than you would with a, a poor ground. And this, that's actually demonstrable. We can show you that, and I've got some slides later. From the safety point of view, uh, we all and we all know of NFPA 33 and most local authorities that come out and inspect booths and that they use NFPA 33 as their guideline for their codes. The, the 33 is a standard, it's not a code, but it's adopted by most code agencies. And it really says anything conductive uh, within the powder booth should have a resistance to ground of less than one mega ohm. Um, the, uh, the, <laughs> this is one of my favorite points. And don't, don't take this to the boss because he'll get mad at you. But if you're hanging parts on hooks that look like this picture, your part has no ground on it. I can guarantee it, it has no ground. And therefore, you are uh, in violation of the NFPA 33 standard because you have metal, i.e. your part, that is, is greater than one megaohm of resistance to ground. At the very least, on hooks, you should be grinding off the low point in each hook uh, down to bare metal. So your, your metal part has bare metal uh, uh, has a bare metal connection on the hook to ground. Now, this is kind of cool. I'm going to show you a little video here. I don't know if you can see it, but on the second uh, injector from the right, you see that little spark. That's a result of, of static or electrostatic energy being built up with no ground to take it away except for that lid on that hopper. And once that energy level builds up high enough, that arc will jump to the part. That's outside of a booth. That same thing can happen inside of a booth from part to hook, from part to, to, uh, to uh, load bar, et cetera. So from a quality point of view, we're gonna talk a little bit about Ohm's law here. Again, Ohm's law is a law of physics. Um, it's a, a, a law that it's, it's not a law that a president or a Congress or anybody else can change. It's a law of physics. It says simply that voltage equals current, that's I, times resistance, which is R. And uh, with too much voltage, you create too many excess free ions. And if you look at those samples there, uh, the back sample is properly coded, the front sample was coded and at high voltage and high current, and we got a resultant uh, back ionization for that. Um, again, from a quality point of view, a good ground also ensures uh, film thickness uniformity, and you'll see in a later slide what I mean by that. And who doesn't want a very uniform film, thick, uh, film surface? You don't want areas where you have one mil and areas where you have five mils, et cetera. You want a nice, even, um, uh, distribution of powder on your parts. So here's here's a uh, um, here's the process in in a nutshell. We have a, a powder gun that has a hundred thousand volts on the electrode tip, and if we present a a well grounded metal part in front of it, when we pull the trigger, we get a current flow of ions from the electrode to the grounded part. And the, 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 uh, the amount of electro or the amount of ions created is a function of Ohm's law. So I'm gonna go ahead one slide here. In our world, you see 100,000 volts at the gun tip, you see a well-grounded part, and the resistance in the Ohm's law formula is the air gap between the electrode and the grounded part. Typically in our world, we're looking at eight to 10 inches. Um, it's real important that that stays uniform. As the gun gets closer to the grounded part, the resistance goes down. When the resistance goes down, the current goes up. Again, current is the evil, current, current is both the necessary, I guess we call it the necessary evil. We need to have current flow in order to create ions. If we have too much current flow, then we create too many ions. Uh, scientists have found that 80% uh, 
of the ions created at 100,000 volts with a good ground in front of it, 80% of those ions never charge powder particles. They literally stay attached to air molecules. They, 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 they add zero value to the process. Um, in fact, they add negative value because they build up on the part surface and uh, create issues for us. And the, the issues are um, either back ionization, orange peel, or Faraday cage. If you look at the example on the right, on the Faraday cage, those red lines you see there, those are excess free ions, ions that are attached to air molecules and not powder particles. So they're finding the closest point of ground in order to flow current to it. Um, and, and if you have significantly strong force fields as is depicted on this uh, picture here, what happens is the powder particles that are in that uh, cloud there also, they get drawn to those two force fields and we get an excess buildup of powder on the outer edges and a lack of powder on the inner, on the inner uh, edges. On the back ionization side, it's a simple thing. You can only build up so many layers of ions on the surface of a grounded metal part. After you exceed a certain level, you actually have a, a phenomena where the lower level ions flip over to positive charges or the plate gives off positive charges. Those blow through the layers of powder, leaving behind craters, which then become orange peel. So again, we're talking about multiple layers of charges, not multiple layers of powder. If all the layers of were powder, then we would get our film thickness quick without any back ionization. But because 80% of the ions were thrown out there are going to the same surface, we build up layers quicker and therefore orange peel happens quicker. So in both of these examples, the evil in the process is excess free ions. Uh, Choline Corporation back 15 years, 15 or 16 years ago, did a, a film build study at a company called Carrier Corporation down in Colliersville, um, Tennessee. And uh, what they found was after a hook, uh, the first initial use of a hook in a powder line, you got good ground, as you can see on the left profile there, pretty uniform film surface. After the second uh, use of that hook on a, on a new part, uh, the film thickness varied a little bit, but was still within acceptable levels. The third time a hook was used, the surface profilophity looked like this right here. So after using a hook three times, you get a degraded process, a degraded surface finish. And you can see some of these areas down here where you got really uh, low uh, coverage, those are gonna come out as, as rust, uh, surface rust on your parts once it's out in, in its actual environment. The heavy parts, the real thick parts, are gonna be susceptible to cracking and spalling because they're too thick. Mechanical properties are, are affected when the coating is too thick. Chemical and electrical properties are affected when the, when the uh, film thickness is too thin. Obviously, the key is to get a nice uniform film thickness with no, no low points and no high points. You're only going to get that when you have an excellent ground, and that ground is transferred through the hook. And after two uses of the hook, that ground uh, uh, starts to degrade. And after five uses, it's almost, almost assuredly gone. And from a cost point of view, uh, ground. Um, a good ground highly and significantly improves your transfer efficiency and um, your film thickness uh, uh, quality. So um, it's really important. I, I, I keep drilling this into people's heads about ground, but here's an example, a couple examples. I'm looking at, at both automatic and manual guns. We'll look at the manual guns first. I like to break down people into uh, different size users. A small user could be a, a very small one-man shop 
all the way up to an XL user, which is a large corporate paint line. Um, what you want to look at on this is, is um, a 10% improvement in first pass transfer efficiency will save you uh, on a manual environment up to $75,000 in powder costs at $3. This slide's a little old. It was back when powder was literally $3 a pound. Now it's up four, five, six dollars a pound. So you can multiply those numbers by two at least. Uh, a 10% first pass transfer efficiency change is, is as simple as keeping clean hooks on your line. If you're using automatic guns, uh, again, an automatic gun doesn't have a human triggering it, so it's spraying out into space as long as there's parts there, powder will get, get onto parts. But again, you look at, at uh, a simple transfer efficiency improvement, you can save up to $300,000 a year in powder costs. This is factual. This isn't hypothetical. This is factual. Improving your ground will save you money on powder. Um, that's one of the things I get asked all the time. You know, well, we understand ground's important, but we can't afford to strip our hooks every every third time. Um, I would argue this and say that you you can't afford not to. Uh, uh, again, on this one here, we're talking about in order to assure a minimum film thickness that hides metal and provides uh, um, the uh, characteristics that the data sheet says it'll deliver, whether it's corrosion resistance, electric, uh, electrical resistance, et cetera. Um, the spec calls for three mil thickness. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna, if you, in order to be safe, if you apply four or five mils and say, hey, that's okay, at least I met minim minimum film thickness, um, this is what it costs. Uh, um, for each additional mill you put on over the three mill spec, it's adding up to up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year if you're a power user. And I'm I'm talking about somebody who's using two hundred fifty thousand pounds a year. You know, a lot of these large facilities, that's easy. So um, again, if you have bad ground, now you're adding extra powder to get your minimum film build, your average film build, up to your specification of three mils, where now you have areas and significant areas of four or five or six mils in other areas. So all the extra cost of extra powder to ensure minimum fill, film thickness because of poor ground is just money that you're throwing away. So hopefully hopefully we get some, uh, some questions or, or you reach out later and, and I'll be happy to talk. Actually on the PCI website, there's a uh, webinar that was that I did several years ago that covers all aspects of ground and what's what's a good ground, what's a bad ground, etc. Ah, uh, now here's one of my favorite videos. Uh, we talk about um, you know powder gun manufacturers get asked all the time, you know, what's your transfer efficiency? What's your transfer efficiency? And you know there is no uniform standard for testing. Uh, uh, transfer efficiency, um, unfortunately, but there's just so many variables. But one of the major variables, and this is what I throw back at somebody who asked me that question, I say, well, is your booth designed properly or is your booth a wind tunnel? And I'll show the video now. Um, most companies design their booths at 100 uh, foot a minute incoming airflow through all openings, the doors, the whatever. and at 100 foot a minute, this is what happens to you. So you trigger your gun. Now the filters are off to the left in this video. Um, so obviously the air is gonna go that way. But if, you're, if your part was that horizontal bar there, you can see that a good 50% of the spray pattern never even reaches the part because the velocity in the booth at 100 foot a minute is pulling powder towards the filters and away from the parts. <coughs> So clearly 100 foot a minute uh, velocity in the spray zone is way too much. We recommend anywhere from 40 to 60 foot a minute. In this video, I think we, we dial it in at about 50 foot a minute. It's bouncing around a little bit, but right around 40, 50 foot a minute. Again, you see powder going towards the filters, that's natural. But what you see here 
as you see that 100% of the powder coming out of that gun is hitting that part. 50 foot a minute crosswind is not pulling powder away from your parts. This is 100 foot a minute. And we'll see here in a, another couple seconds, 50. I mean, that's if if that doesn't convince you to look at the air flows in your spray zone uh, and, and make some changes to your booth, um, I don't know what will. I mean, that's just a video that shows it spot on. And again, this is mainly aimed at the batch guys who have a open face booth. If you have an open face booth, on, in your plant, most likely you're fighting that 100 foot a minute crosswind and not getting anywhere close to the 50. So what else is important? Maintenance, okay? Uh, clean and inspect your powder gun on every color change. So don't just hit the purge button and then go in and uh, uh, change colors. We recommend tearing the gun down, doing a quick cleanup of the gun. And while you're doing that, inspect the powder gun okay um do you use cleansing air most gun manufacturers have a cleansing air feature on their guns it's a third air it's another airline that goes to the gun and what that does is it blows uh clean dry air through the uh, uh tunnel or channel that your electrode goes through um what it does is it keeps or it prevents a buildup between your electrode wire and the housing that the electrode's in. If you do get a buildup in there, you'll get a, a degraded uh, quality of uh, electrons at the surface because we leak off a little bit of the uh, current through the powder into the gun body itself. Uh, and then every day or on a regular basis, the powder pipe that goes through the gun, we recommend uh, inspecting that for impact fusion. Um, and don't wait till half the powder pipes closed off because of impact fusion. Clean it immediately if you see any any evidence of uh, buildup starting. Your injector and throat pipe. Again, I talked about the gun being blown off uh, completely at every color change. Do the same thing uh, to the injector and throat pipe. Um, every time you change colors, pull the pull the injector apart, blow it off, clean it out. And at the same time, inspect the throat pipe. If you see any kind of wear on the throat pipe, it's time to replace it. It's not wait until it's double the diameter. It's once you start seeing erosion at the throat pipe entrance or anywhere along the throat pipe, it's time to replace it. Because as that throat pipe diameter, inner diameter gets bigger, less powder comes out of the gun. And so what does a painter do? He'll go over and turn up the compressed air and gets back to his normal powder flow. But now he's flowing it at a higher uh, air volume, which translates to a higher velocity coming out of the end of the gun. Uh, and in powder coating, we say more is never better. So more velocity actually coming out of the end of the gun, you want the least amount of velocity. You want just enough to get the powder from the gun tip to the part. So again, Anytime you see the beginning of wear on your throw pipe, replace it with a new one. If you see impact fusion, either on the nozzle inside of the, uh, the injector or in the throat pipe itself, any kind of impact fusion is affecting the laminar airflow that's required to make that uh, uh, injector work. Clean up the impact fusion. Check your powder hose at the injector discharge, which you what will find is if the hose coming off of the, uh, the, the injector comes off at a tight radius, we'll see wear inside of that, that pipe or inside of that hose, and that's not good. Clean your booth on a regular basis, okay? Uh, use a squeegee. We recommend using a squeegee rather than compressed air. All compressed air does is move it from one location to another to another. Finally, you get it all to the filters. But it's honestly a whole lot simpler just to squeegee down the booth walls and the squeegee the booth floor. You get a lot, a lot more powder movement a lot quicker. You can go back and do a blushing air, air uh, blow off with the compressed air if you like. Um, but mainly use a squeegee to clean your booth, not compressed air. And the other thing we see a lot is uh, cartridge filter systems where the painters will be annoyed by the pop that they hear every 30 to 
30 seconds to three minutes, they'll turn it off. And once you turn off that uh, uh, pulsing system on your cartridge filters, now you're, now you're seeing degraded airflow through the day. So we recommend that the pulse system stays on all day, not just at the end of the shift. What else do we need to do? Check your dryer regularly. If, if the dryer is back in that dark corner of your plant, you don't know whether you're supplying dry air to the, pow to the powder operations or not. So check it regularly. Uh, again, if, if powder or if uh, moisture or oil gets by the dryer and gets into your system, it's a very expensive charge to clean out your controller. Uh, you're gonna replace all of your fluid, uh, fluidizing tiles. Um, just not a good idea to, to ignore your dryer. Uh, and, and make sure as little insurance you have pre and post filters on your dryer back in the plant, make sure the dryer uh, has an, the, the filters have an automatic drain on them and make sure the automatic drain is working. If you have a, a post dryer filter that's accumulating moisture, at some point it's gonna get filled up and just continue to bypass and get to your guns. Um, make sure you have a reliable compressed air system at least 90 PSI. If you fall below 90 PSI in most manufacturers' powder guns, you're gonna start having issues. Uh, what else? That covers that. So kind of wrapping it up here, um, I rambled a little bit, it's the way I do things, but I, I, your, your takeaway from this presentation is this, powder coating is a process. It's important you understand that a lot of things have to work properly in order for the process to work. It's not a singular thing. You don't pull a trigger and point it. You need to make sure you got good powder, good fluidization, good booth, et cetera. And powder coating certainly is not maintenance free. It, it, it requires regular maintenance in order to be optimized. I can't tell you how many plants I go into and there's powder boxes sitting all over the place. Some of them are open, everything, everything, a, a well-maintained operation is gonna give you the best possible outcome. And it does require trained painters. Uh, honestly, you know, I know there's a lot of turnover in the, in the painters uh, world. Um, and so turnover causes people to be thrown into operation with no training other than, hey, trigger the gun and point it at the part you really need to, to at least have an in-house training program that you can take a new guy, new gal, put them in a room, let them go through some slides and get an idea of what happens when they pull that trigger. It's really, really important. I also say it requires uh, maintenance, our supervisors, managers, and owners commitment and full support. People, the finish you put on your parts is going to, to quickly sway the consumer's opinion of your product. If your product is the greatest product in the world and it's got a lousy finish, it's not the greatest product in the world. At least it's not gonna be perceived as that. Spend money, spend time on your coating operation. It is what the consumer sees. Um, and powder coating is the best finish for most coating requirements. And with that, I'm turning it back over to Kevin. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, John. Uh, we do have a couple questions here, um, so we'll uh, start running through them. Um, on the point about cleaning your uh, your booth, should brooms be used with the powder coating booth itself? So I I, I wouldn't recommend brooms because they're going to get caked up with with powder and and get clogged up. I, I would suggest go and buy a good a good flexible industrial squeegee maybe two foot wide or 30 inches wide and use that. You can, if you have it on a long handle, you can pull down powder off your booth walls from top to bottom and then uh, uh, push it in. Most people will push the powder under the filters in, their, in, in, in a batch booth or into their collection hopper in a conveyorized booth. So I, I think I'd stay away from a broom. I'd, I'd stay with a squeegee and I really recommend not using compressed air. The perception is it's faster. The reality is a proper squeegee uh, will clean a booth much quicker. Okay. Um, 
my parts are heavy, so they break up the powder built up on the hooks. Uh, can I get by with less frequent cleaning of my hooks? <laughs> well, that's a good, I hear that all the time. Um, you know, I got heavy parts, so when I drop them onto the hook, it, it breaks off the powder that's cured and built up on the hook and I get to bare metal. And I'm gonna tell you, that's just not the case. Um, we use powder coatings because they're very, very durable and not susceptible to cracking. So uh, it's a fallacy that if I, if I got a dirty hook, all I gotta do is hang a, a, um, a heavy part on it and it breaks through and finds ground. That's just not the case. The study I mentioned to you from Colleen Corporation uh, was aimed 100% at dispelling that myth. Um, and to go into it would take another half an hour, so I won't. Um, but but that study did disprove it. These parts that they were hanging at this plant were heavy and they had very sharp edges on them. And so if, if there was a case where dropping a part on a hook would break through the powder and get metal to metal, that would be it. And that study proved that after two uses, that you know, once you exceeded two uses, your ground path was essentially gone. So no, that, that won't work. Okay. Um, what about an operator wearing gloves? So gloves are fine. So, so powder is hygroscopic, H-Y-G-R, hygroscopic. That means it, it wants to absorb moisture. So, you know, if you're powder coating with no glove on and you're getting powder on your hand, first of all, if you're getting a lot of powder on your hand when you're powder coating, if your hand gets coated the same color as what's coming out of the end of the gun, that's 100% guarantee that your parts are not grounded because those powder particles are finding ground at your hand, which is behind the gun rather than, than uh, uh, ground on the parts. So again, if, if, you're, if you're a coder and you, know, you paint one part and your hand's the same color, you painted a part that had no ground. But getting back to gloves, so if we don't, you know, if we get powder on our hands, it's sucking the moisture out of our skin, we get dry skin. So one thing we don't wanna do is start throwing lotion on our hands because lotion can have things in it that will cause uh, defects on your part like fish eyes, et cetera. So gloves are acceptable. However, they can't be latex gloves. They have to be conductive gloves because your path to ground is your hand on the gun handle. That's where your hand gets earth ground. So if you've got a barrier like a latex glove between it and your hand, you are now not grounded and you can be susceptible to electrostatic zaps. So, and they do make, uh, they do make conductive gloves. So if you're gonna wear gloves, seek out a pair of conductive gloves. Okay. Um, is there more info, info on grounding testing? Uh, master electrician is questioning why a mega? So we want to drive. So if we were using a, a, a simple multimeter, that, that testing, that, that resistance testing is driven at, at nine volts, which is very low. Um, and it, it, it could miss ground pass that are available at a higher voltage, like we're at 100,000 volts. So we recommend using the mega, mega ohm meter because we're now checking our ground path and our resistivity at, at uh, 1,000 volts rather than nine. Uh, you will find that you'll have ground with a mega where you'll not find ground with a nine volt battery. Uh, standard multimeter. So, you know, I guess we're using the mega to 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 get us closer to um, um, reality than a nine volt battery. Okay. Um, is there a way to control the ratio of virgin and reclaimed powder? Generally, on on a reclaimed environment, that ratio, most powder manufacturers want a 70-30 ratio, 70% virgin, 30% reclaimed which is really hard to do if you're only transferring at a 50% rate. You're going to have an accumulation of reclaim greater than you're going to be able to use unless you take your ratio to 50-50, uh, which we don't recommend and neither would any powder guys. So generally what's, what controls that is you have two sources of powder for your feed hopper. You have a virgin uh, a drum or box with a transfer pump 
And then on the reclaim side, your reclaim hopper under your filters is uh, got a transfer pump on it. Both of those transfer lines go into a mini cyclone on top of your hopper. The best way to do it is to simply take a weigh bag and pump, uh, put it on the end of your, your, your virgin transfer pump and uh, uh, run that, weigh it out, do it for 30 seconds, weigh it out, that's and multiply it by two. That's the pumping rate of the virgin pump. Then go pull off your reclaim hose at your mini cyclone. Do the same thing, weigh bag it for 30 seconds, multiply that by two. That's how much powder's coming from your reclaim. Then what you want to do is you want to adjust the pressure regulators on each transfer pump so that 70% of the total sum that's transferred to your feed hopper comes from your virgin side and 30% comes from your reclaim side. It takes a few iterations, but it is a super critical uh, uh, way because if you get if you get too many fines in your feed hopper, your transfer efficiency goes down. And then, then all of a sudden you got that much more reclaim to deal with. So hopefully that explained it. If if people are are curious about learning more on that, have them reach out to you, Kevin, and and then send it to me and I'll send them a little white paper on how it's done. Okay. Um, how do you determine the best distance the gun should be away from the part? Or is there a good distance for most all, all applications? So, so optimum distance is eight to 10 inches. If you get closer, if you remember the Ohm's law thing, as you get closer, your current goes up, you create more access free ions and you create more issues for you. Further back than 10 inches, now you don't have a velocity to get all of the powder to the part. So you'll start seeing powder dropping off and accumulating on the booth floor. So eight, eight to 10 inches is optimum. We certainly don't want you to go into Faraday cages with the tip three inches away from the corner because now you're going to get pressure blowback. Um, you know, on, 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 on Faraday cages, I tell people six to eight inches. On everyday coating, eight to 10. Okay. Um, why would operators complain about getting shocks? So... Okay, so two things. One, they're isolated from the gun, so they're not they're not well grounded. So any surface that has a buildup of ions on it, if they're if they get close enough to that surface, those ions will see themselves, their hand, whatever, as ground, and the ions will all jump from the part to their finger and get a little poke. Generally, that's the case. You're if, if you're getting shocked a lot, you don't have well grounded parts. I can guarantee that. If you hear snapping while you're powder coating, if you hear snap, 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 it's another 100% guarantee that your that your uh, part you're painting is not well grounded. A well grounded part will pull off excess free ions, will pull off ions, pull off charge, and not leave any opportunity for somebody to get a poke. Okay. Um, are you aware, is there any template or spec on basic processes and maintenance uh, that could be easily incorporated into my business? So so I my counsel on that would be to go to, to your major vendors on your line, your, your chemical guy, uh, your powder guy, your application guy, and then maybe your systems house if you're in a, a conveyorized environment. They'll all have uh, recommended operating procedures um, for their their portion of the process. Um, also, I, most manuals have recommended operating procedures, have set up procedures to find. That's another thing, you know, we do in the PCI, we talk about uh, um, predictive and, and uh, preventative maintenance. And that all starts with reading the documentation you're given on your equipment. I mean, the first line of defense is reading the manual and understanding it for whatever, whether it's a pump on your on your pretreatment tank or or your powder gun or your powder booth, read the manual. Manuals have uh, all, all the information you need to, to maintain, troubleshoot, and uh, initial setup your equipment. Okay, great. Um, 
Well, uh, that is the last of the questions, unless anybody has one last one they want to post. Otherwise, I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, the, we do have the Powder Coated Tough magazine, which is dedicated to the powder industry exclusively. Um, we have it uh, uh, both in print and digital editions for our English version here in the US. And also, John, if you could flip a slide, uh, we now also offer uh, digital editions in Spanish. Um, and these can be all subscribed for free at uh, powdercoatedtough.com. Uh, so definitely if you're in the industry, it's always has some great information um, that uh, you can continue learning. Um, also on the screen right now is uh, my email address. As John had mentioned, if there are any questions that uh, pop up on here, uh, be more than happy to uh, forward them I was on to John and we will get back to you. Um, and want to thank everyone uh, for uh, attending today. And John, thank you for putting this together. It was very interesting. Uh, I just remind everybody to visit the PCI website, uh, www.powdercoating.org. We have more information on webinars and upcoming training events. Um, we also have added a Spanish webinar in August on the fundamentals of powder coating. So be sure to check that out if you or your company have Spanish speaking personnel. Other than that, as soon as uh, we sign off here, there will be a link that pops up to take that survey, take a few moments and give us your feedback, give us ideas on anything else you'd like us to have presented that you think would uh, be interesting to everyone. Other yeah, than that, I, I want to If thank I can everyone. jump in real quick, that is sure. really important, everybody. Your feedback is read and we do pay attention to it. So. If there's something you want to hear that we didn't cover or haven't covered, let us know. The PCI is very, very uh, keen on, on, on training, and we get our best advice from you guys. So thank you very much, by the way. And with that, I would just uh, like to uh, pass on and wish everybody have a great rest of the day. Um, and we thank you for attending. <laughs>